So I'm Nick. This is our fourth and now final milestone for CPE 4850 Senior Project. This is our system topology for our EMG movement classification system. So we're using two of the MyAware Surface EMG sensors. These sensors have two outputs. One is a raw EMG and one is a integrated rectified and enveloped EMG signal. Currently that's what we're using. So all of the filtering happens on that board. Currently there's no software filtering in place. Nick Housley, the clinical director at Modus Nova, who is, that's the startup we're working with on this project, has advised a couple uh, software filtering methods that would be put in place if we were to continue this project. So those signals are being passed along to an MCP3208 analog to digital converter. What's nice about that converter is it's a hat style, so it sits on top of the Raspberry Pi using this set of pins. So there's already libraries built for the MCP3208 to be used with Python on the Raspberry Pi. We were actually planning on using a NVIDIA Jetson Nano, but we couldn't seem to get the MCP3208 to work. The Jetson Nano advertises as having the same pin layout as the Raspberry Pi, so we didn't think it would have a problem initially. But upon further digging, there seems to be a couple voltage level differences with the Jetson Nano. And also we couldn't get the built-in libraries for the Raspberry Pi to work. Theoretically, it should work fine, but we actually found that we don't really need the processing power of the Jetson Nano to classify these signals. So our three signals are from two MyAware SEMG sensors. And then one signal is a simple analog voltage which is the angle readout from the Modus Nova hand mentor. So all that's going on there is a potentiometer lives inside one of these joints. And as the user moves their hand up and down, their wrist angle changes. So when their wrist angle changes, that's reflected on the potentiometer and you can read the voltage to see where their wrist is at angle wise. So the MCP3208 has eight channels. So we're using two channels for the MyAware SEMGs and then one channel for the angle. So the sampling is 12 bits at a maximum of 100 kilosamples per second. We're basically just getting the fastest samples per second possible out of uh, Python on the Raspberry Pi. We're just basically having it spam the ADC and get however much data it can. So theoretically, it could be running at 100 kilosamples per second. So that data capture is happening using Python on the Raspberry Pi. It's nice about the Raspberry Pi is it has a very stable, well-developed Python platform with lots of libraries. So for development where you don't want to have to write the drivers to make your ADC work, the Raspberry Pi is very nice. So using the signal output from the, the Modus Nova hand monitor, we have the analog angle voltage, which we can reference to the uh, SEMG signals. That's very useful for classification because we have a signal that very clearly defines where the user's wrist is at. I'll let Noah explain a little bit more about why that's useful for classification. So using the Raspberry Pi, data is ingested through the ADC and then classified with the neural network. So that's a, a loop there because then we have data going out to our GUI website, which is in, I guess, beta phase because this milestone only included just getting the website up and running. But the final version, should there be one of the website, would have two SEMG graphs and then some indication of the user intent. So there's three output classifications from the CNN. With the Hand Mentor Pro, basically we're only interested in whether the user is trying to go up with their wrist, down, or if there's no movement. With the EMG sensor, it's not impossible, but very difficult to classify the uh, degree of which the user is moving their wrist. So it's only classifying whether it's an up or down. It's, so it's taking the integral or the derivative of the motion. It's not actually classifying the position. So in the final version of this project, the CNN output would actually go to the Modus Nova Hand Mentor base station. What's very cool about that is that would allow the Hand Mentor to serve a pretty much unserved market of stroke survivors who have a very limited range of motion. So for those people who don't have enough motion to actually use the hand mentor due to the physical limitations of linkages and a potentiometer, you would be able to gain the intent of whether they want to move their wrist up or down. And using the hand mentor, you'd be able to assist their movement upwards or downwards based on the EMG signal. So once the CNN classifies what they're trying to do, you would be able to assist them in moving up or down. And over time, that feedback would theoretically be able to build up the strength 
and the correlation between what's going on in their brain and what's going on in their arm for them to be able to gain a little bit of that motion back and potentially really make a difference in someone's life because going from a couple millimeters of movement to going to a couple centimeters of movement it doesn't sound like a lot but could be enough to enable someone to open a door or pick up a glass and just do normal day-to-day -day things so the myware muscle sensors have been pretty interesting to work with it's a surface emg sensor so semg when you talk about EMG, there's SEMG and normal EMG, which is an invasive EMG. Invasive EMG would be like sticking a needle in someone's muscle and basically reading the electrical current directly off their muscle. That's much more accurate, but you know, for senior project, we can't really go sticking uh, electrodes into people's arms. So surface EMG was the route we had to take. Surface EMG provides a couple challenges in that you're not measuring directly the person's muscle, you have the subcutaneous fat in the way as well. So people's arms are different from person to person because the fat content between the skin and the muscle will be different. So with these sensors, this uh, screw right here is a potentiometer which adjusts the gain. We found that if the gain is improperly adjusted, you can saturate the sensor and the output signal will stay high for a couple of seconds, which would basically make it useless for from a classification point of view. But you have to tune it so that you have the maximum possible amplitude without reaching saturation, because if you get to saturation, it will stay there for a couple of seconds probably a flaw due to the design of these boards. If you don't raise the amplitude to where it should be, then you don't get a high enough amplitude signal for the CNN to work with, and you, you'd have to retrain the CNN. So these sensors not having an adaptive gain is certainly a challenge for this kind of application. Given that they are you know, hobby enthusiast grade, they're $38 each. That's probably the cheapest EMG sensor you can buy. So we were using a daughter board, which lets us use these extended SEMG electrode connectors. We found that the connectors make it possible for us to do this because it is sort of infeasible to have two of these on someone's arm while doing data collection while wearing the Modus Nova hand mentor. But these extended electrode connectors give us another problem where the wires are not shielded well enough. So it provides a lot of feedback if you even just touch the wires while you're doing data collection. So like I explained earlier, there's two output signals from these boards. There's the raw EMG, which is very noisy, but has a little bit more data in it, and the enveloped integrated rectified EMG. That's what we ended up using. But if we were to do over or have more time, I think the raw EMG would be a better place to start and then build your own filter, just because you're losing a little bit of data if you're using the onboard enveloping, integrating, and rectifying given that it's a, a pretty inexpensive little board. We also experienced problems with these in terms of reliability. Sometimes they would seem to work great, and other times we wouldn't be able to get a single one of our four boards to work. So for a test, it's fine, because we just have to record data when we know they're all working. But you would never want to put this into production, because in a product, you wouldn't want sensors that just work sometimes and don't work at other times. So the Modus Nova Hand Mentor is basically the heart of the system, and what we're working on adding functionality to. So this product is developed by Modus Nova. They're an Atlanta medical tech startup. So it's created for stroke rehabilitation at home. Stroke rehabilitation historically would only be able to be done in a, a clinical trial or in a physical therapy type setting. This device allows you to take it home with you and cuts the cost of physical therapy by a lot because you don't have to have a physician. The person can put the device on themselves without instruction from a person and it allows them to work on the rehabilitation at home without having to pay for PT. So all of the sensing from this device is done through a simple densiometer in this axis here. So there's only one axis of data. When you're moving your wrist up or down, the potentiometer will change, and that's, that's all of the data that comes out of this device. From that feedback, there's an air bladder in this section of the hand mentor, and the air bladder can push the user's wrist up or down and provide feedback. So the current use of the hand mentor is it has a tablet-like device that this connects to, which also supplies air for the pneumatic part. So the user is actually going to play video games using this, which sort of provides a less boring way of doing repetitive motions up and down. Because the rehabilitation for a stroke patient is just simply doing exercises of moving your wrist up or down many times. So by providing a video game, it's making that PT a little bit more transparent. So this is the ADC we ended up using, the MCP3208. We chose this because it connects directly to the Raspberry Pi and already has libraries for its onboard ADC. It's a 12-bit ADC with eight channels and 100 kill samples per second, which proved to be plenty. 
we ended up having data files of five plus megabytes of purely text. So if you think about how many lines of numbers that is, we were able to get quite a lot of data out of this thing quickly with high resolution. So the MCP3208 was probably the least problematic thing in this entire project, except that the Jetson Nano didn't work with it, but I think that's more a fault of the Jetson Nano. Like I said, we ended up using the Raspberry Pi. The model we used was the 3B+. Plus. It's not really important which one we used, but you need enough processing power that you can read from the ADC quickly enough and write to disk. We actually, I think at one point during data collection, lost responsiveness to the display because the Raspberry Pi was just writing so much data concurrently. Like I said, what's nice about using the Raspberry Pi is the availability of libraries and a pretty solid Python development platform, which has been used by countless people. So pretty much all of our development on this guy happened with uh, VS Code Remote SSH. So that's a Microsoft API or product built into VS Code, which lets you from any network connect to a networked Raspberry Pi, and it uses an SSH tunnel to let you do um, multi-user development. So me, Nate, Julian, and, and Noah could all be writing code on one Raspberry Pi from our own homes while the Raspberry Pi stays connected to the internet at the school campus lab. So that was pretty invaluable, letting all of us work on it in the same Raspberry Pi from different remote locations. So we used CNN classification, that's convolutional neural network. We used manually labeled data. We found that automatically labeled data, it was challenging to get the accuracy high enough. The threshold was just very difficult to define. So manually labeled data ended up being what we used, also at the advice of um, Nick Hosley at Modus Novo. I'll let Noah describe the CNN aspect a little more. He's the uh, lead designer in the CNN by far. So we used a web GUI just to show the user basically what would be like a prototype of what you would see on the Modus Nova Hand Mentor. So the web GUI was live graphing some basically toast data. We were just using a distance sensor instead of using the uh, EMG boards since we didn't have our lab environment anymore. So data is leaving the Python data collection script and getting ingested into JavaScript, where it's then wrapped in HTML. So that's using a Python server on the Raspberry Pi itself. And that was using the Plotly library for interactive live graph. So this here is a Plotly. It allows the user to zoom in, move around, span this graph. So if, if this were a finished product, you would see the two EMG signals, and then you'd have a classification box saying movement up, movement down, or no movement and then you could have a percentage of certainty. So the final evolution of this project, which will hopefully still happen, maybe on the Modus Nova side or on a continued research, would be fully enabling this thing to work with Modus Nova's base station. So actually embedding sensors into the hand mentor, which would then talk to the base station, which is the brains of the hand mentor device. So that would use the convolutional neural net output to gain the intent of whether the user is trying to move up or down. And that would allow the device to use the air bladder to either assist or resist motion up or down, depending on what the application is. So this kind of development, when it finally gets to a production level stage, will really be pretty breakthrough in terms of take home PT, because it will allow previously a completely unserved market to have a device that they can take home and not have to pay to go to PT to use. So it would greatly expand the audience for the Modus Nova Head Mentor. And that's my part of the milestone. All right, I'm Julian Duran from Team Rehab. And for this milestone four, I was working with Noah to work on the modeling and data labeling. So to do our model, we first had to determine what was the best way to label our data. The first approach we took was automated approach, which is pretty much collecting our data on the Pi, converting it to a CSV file, and then putting it into a script that would window the data. And the script would create a gradient of the potentiometer data within the window. And that gradient would be compared to a threshold that was preset by us. And so if the gradient was, fell over that threshold, then the label would be movement up. If it fell under the threshold, then the label would be movement down. And if it was within the threshold, then the label would be no movement. So as you can see, the figure on the right shows that there is uh, no movement if you just follow the line and the X is time. So after the manual labeled data that we collected, we tried to build a model using only the EMG data, like leaving out the potentiometer data. Because originally our goal was to use the potentiometer data for the automatic labeling 
but Modus Nova advised that we just use the potentiometer data in the model because it'll be available anyway. So here are some graphs of the accuracies of different models over 50 epochs. The average accuracy was around 46%, which if we go back to our data set is the same percentage of the no movement class, which is our majority class. So basically what these models would do is attempt to classify every input window as no movement, which is wrong because it's only 46% of our data set. So I ended up putting in potentiometer data. So our window size is 250 samples. We have our two EMG sensors, our potentiometer sensor data, and I also did a fast Fourier transform of each of the sensor data windows. So the total number of samples in each window is 1,500, and all of our windows together, we have 12,000. So I reshaped the size of the window to be a 30 by 50 from 250 by six. So you can kind of imagine it as like an image. It's 30 pixels by 50 pixels. That's the input to the machine learning model. And the outputs are our three classes, move up, move down, or no movement. And here are the layers we have. I could go through them if it's necessary. I don't think it is for now. Here is the evaluation of our model. So we split the training data and the test data. We use 90% of the data in this data set with the 12,000 samples for training the model. And then 10% of that number is left over for testing. And this is important because the model should be generalizable. So it was trained on you know, the first 90% of our data. But if it can't get a good accuracy on the data we left out, that means that it's not going to be generalizable to new data when we hook up to our Mentor Pro. So here is the evaluation. So that's the 10% that we left over for testing. And the average accuracy of the model after putting in the potentiometer data was around 93%. Also, this is what it looks like when the model predicts inputs. So here is one input window, and I already have the true label because we have the manually labeled windows. And this is the label that was generated by the model. And so it was a correct prediction. And so I put true here. And you can see for these 10 windows that I randomly selected, after training the model, it correctly labeled them. Also, these windows came from the test set, not the training set. And here is a graph of the accuracy over 50 epochs. And it got around 93%. This is Nate Weinberg for my milestone for Milestone 4. I was tasked with creating a web GUI interface for interacting with the EMG data coming from our Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi is running a Python script to collect the data from the ADC. So what I was able to do was utilize a Python script and capture that data and then deliver it over to a web interface. Unfortunately, since we don't have our testing environment available to us, I was not able to use the EMG data and the potentiometer data to graph. However, I utilized a ultrasonic sensor to act as my GPIO raw data input. And I have a little GIF of it here to demonstrate kind of what's going on. And I can demonstrate, I'll move my hand really close and see the graph drops down and I'll move it progressively farther and farther and farther away and it will pop back up. So this whole website was running a Python web server and the Python web server is connected with uh, sockets and utilizing Flask in Python to talk with a JavaScript front end that will display the Plotly graph right here. And it's really cool because the JavaScript will just overwrite this one line in our HTML as the new data comes in at every sample. So you can see how the graph will gradually change or rapidly change. The Plotly library is really neat because if you wanted to look at a specific section of your data, you can just zoom in and analyze it and see all the different points of the plot 
you can reset the axis, auto scale, all those kinds of things, which is really, really cool and very valuable. One of the ways that we attempted to actually build this website was utilizing Docker containers. And I learned a lot using Docker containers, one of which was you can mount a file on your local system to live edit a Docker container website, which was very, very cool. Also, the Docker container didn't work. It just didn't allow me to communicate data between the GPIO interface and then to the website. So what I ended up having to do was utilize that Python web server to be able to communicate with JavaScript. But the Docker container did allow for graphing of randomly generated data from just a JavaScript function. But my biggest problem was just communicating between a Python GPIO data harvesting script and sending that data into JavaScript, which is why I landed on a Python script as the web server and to collect the data and then send that data into JavaScript using API calls that I essentially defined for myself through the Python script and then received it on JavaScript to graph the, uh, or just inject the data into the HTML. Should our project be able to be continued uh, if Milestone 5 would have arisen? I would have certainly done some more changes. We could have utilized the prediction of the movement. So it would have corresponded to the data coming in and it would have said, instead of maybe the newest value, it would have said predicted input up, predicted input, no movement something along those lines. So that's more or less the online GUI website of Milestone 5.